Access Live with Kevin Rankin. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here on All Access Live with Kevin Rankin. I would love it if you could do me a favor. If you are coming here anywhere other than YouTube, go to the link below. Go to youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin. There's a subscribe button. You can hit that one and then hit the like button because I know that you're going to like this episode. If you hit the bell next to the subscribe button, you'll be notified about all of my upcoming guests, of which I have many amazing ones. Um, I also have about 247 other episodes you can go back and look at over the past two years of, uh, during the pandemic. Um, everything from rock stars and athletes to actors and visionaries. So um, those guests have all been brought to you by some special sponsors. I want to thank them here. If you go to fivestarguitars.com slash all access live and you're interested in playing guitar or you want to get that guitar repaired or you want to take lessons from professionals, you can hit that promo code of all access 15. You're going to save 15% off everything you see. Plus, if you're ordering outside of Oregon, there's no sales tax. So you're going to pay no sales tax. You're going to save 15%. And then you'll become an amazing rock star like some of my bandmates. I also want to thank Rhythm Traders. RhythmTraders.com is the greatest drum shop on the West Coast. They've been around over 30 years. If you go there, again, they're Oregon-based, so there's no sales tax if you're outside the area. If you let them know I sent you, they'll give you 10% off. So you're going to save money there as well. And finally, the greatest record store in the on the planet, MusicMillennium.com. Music Millennium's got vinyl. They've got all those uh, those old accessories and novelty items. But uh, more than anything, they've been part of the Independent Record Coalition for decades now and supporting local and uh, national music. So let them know that I sent you. Terry Courier there is going to appreciate that. Now, again, if you're coming there here from Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, uh, anyplace else, and you want to go back and look at past episodes, you can also go to accesskevin.com. This episode has actually been streaming there right now, too, so you can go back and you can look at all the archives. This one in particular, I think, is going to change your um, your perspective on a lot of things. First of all, maybe some uh, physical disabilities that you may have had some um, uh, misconceptions about. But also, um, my next guest and I, we just got in a little bit into conversations of depression, which I have certainly struggled with in the past. And uh, because this is May and it's Mental Health Awareness Month, you can write down this crisis number, 1-877-726-4727. It's a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration crisis line. If you feel like you're struggling and you have no one else to reach out to, please call that number. They're there and they want to listen. They'll get you all sorts of services that can help you out. So um, all that stuff aside, I really want to thank you guys for being here now all the way from the Seattle, Washington area. I've got Megan Blunk with her beautiful, what looks to be a rainforest backdrop. I like that. That's the plan. <laughs> that one's not a lot nicer than my my global map here, but these are all the places that I want to be when I'm not streaming, right? So yeah. Hey, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, um, the photo that I've been using for the promotion on this is your Paralympic gold medal shot, I think, and your hair was a lot shorter. Yeah, is this pan pandemic growth that you've got going on there? Uh, this has been a mission of mine my whole life. Uh, after my accident, I just cut it all off because I used to like bleach it and then, you know, it would be fried and I, I got stressed out in high school and it fell out and I really learned to appreciate hair. Um, so finally, yeah, I always envisioned that um, I would be like, mentally stronger and in a better place by the time my hair was the length I wanted it. <laughs> nice. Goal driven. I like that. Yeah. Hey, where'd you go to school? Um, University of Illinois in Champaign. Oh, I, I knew that was college, but, uh, but you mentioned even high school, you were stressed out in high school. So where were you going to school? Oh, Peninsula high school in Gig Harbor, Washington. Gig Harbor. Yeah. All right. So. I got into some trouble in high school and I was not in the best crowd. I was lost. So the stress was all, you know, self-induced and all of that that comes with mental health. And well, yeah, you know what? I mean, that age is, it's a shitty age, honestly. I mean, nothing makes sense when you're in high school. You know, I, I grew up in Montana. I was telling you that earlier and uh, I too had long hair. I was growing it out then and hanging out with a bad crowd and I was totally in the wrong crowd. I mean, I, I was in a town of, uh, of cowboys and, and I was a rocker, you know? So I, uh, yeah. I, I couldn't wait to get out of there, but, um, 
but we can, we can get into some of the past and how that drives uh, our, our future lives. But I, yeah. uh, I was curious about it because you mentioned, you know, being with the wrong crowd. I've heard your story um, that that led to your accident. Uh, for people that don't know, and I, and I hate to jump right into it, but this might set the stage for our conversation today. Do you want to talk a little bit about maybe, um, you know, the, 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 the fateful accident that brought you to be an Olympian? Yeah. Do you want me to kind of like tell a little bit of the story behind it and then yeah. the accident? Please. Okay. Well, so I grew up able-bodied uh, from until 18 years old. Um, I was the middle, I'm the middle of four sisters. So there's five girls. Um, our parents divorced when I was four. And then my mom remarried. The guy turned out to not be a good person. And he really like destroyed our family. Like me and all my sisters went separate ways from the trauma and we all had to find our own way to figure it out. And um, that was kind of a big start of the mental health struggle that I was on. And um, but I, I always had this mindset that everything happens for a reason and it makes you stronger. And I just had to tell myself that, that that's why I was going through all the pain that I was feeling. Um, but I was so lost and I had no self-esteem and, um, I was naturally athletic. I had potential in, in anything I did, but I didn't believe in myself. No one in my family went to college and we didn't have a lot of money. And I just, I self-sabotaged everything because I was too scared to actually try and then get hurt, you know, by failing. Like I, that pain, I was already in so much pain. I didn't want to be taken over, you know, the top tipped over or whatever. And, um, but I was trying to get it right. So I was doing running start in high school, um, after dropping out and some other stuff happening. Um, so I was doing college in high school and I was working multiple jobs and I thought I was on the right track and I was going to get it together. But then when a month after I graduated high school, I was the passenger in a motorcycle accident. Um, in that crowd that didn't think about their future, you know, the helmet didn't fit. No one thought it was a big deal. So they didn't try and find another one. I was wearing flip flops and a bikini top and short shorts, like on the back of this guy's bike who he was 21. Uh, he had just gotten his motorcycle three weeks earlier and he was giving my friend rides. Um, and I, he just, he wasn't being the safest. Like he was passing cars on corners and, um, I, I didn't feel safe, but, uh, my friends were out their window, like cheering us on, you know? So I was like, okay, it must be okay. Like always second guessing my gut. That's what I've done my whole life. And, um, and then, yeah, he lost control of the bike and we slid into a cement wall barrier and it ejected me off. I flew up and hit a street sign. The helmet that didn't fit came off. My friend was behind us in a truck and saw the whole thing. Um, I went over a 15 foot cement wall drop and then 30 feet down an incline and I broke 18 bones altogether and was paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the start. You've, uh, you know, okay. There's a lot there. I mean, you, you, <laughs> you've, you've had to tell the story a lot of times and I'm sure that some of it becomes repetitious for you, you know, in order for people to kind of get to at least to the, the place that you're at. Yeah, uh, you know, I want to go back a little bit because you mentioned you're you're the middle sister of five mm -hmm. girls, mm -hmm. and, and then with the, the split with your parents, um, did you feel like you had any at least emotional support from the sisters during that time when when there was the the divide with the parents? Yeah. Um. Well, when our parents divorced. I mean, I remember like my mom, you know, crying a lot, trying to pay the bills and we were all trying to comfort her. So like that was kind of something that stuck in my mind. Um, we were there for each other, but we were a mess because our parents were really young when they had all of us. And so they were still very lost themselves. Um, they were 18 and 19 and they popped out, you know, four girls. And then our last sister was from our other uh, stepdad. Um, but we were there for each other as much as we could, but we were just kids. And then when the stepdad, you know, he's a child molester. So, um, with four, five little girls, you know, and, um, and, a and a mom who was struggling financially. So dependent, you know, and, um, at that time, 
we weren't really there for each other. We've only actually just come back together now. We actually just all got tattoos yesterday. We got really? um oh check this right. out. Okay. That down there. I'm the middle, so there's two dots above and two dots below. Wow. Um, but that was like we haven't been together like that in a long time. We we really didn't know how to handle what had happened. We didn't know who to trust, who to believe, who had our best interests, and no one talked about it. So we didn't know ever, you know. Yeah. And it was like I was in fourth grade when that came out. So oh my god, yeah. um, survival mode from the beginning for sure. I just I, in fourth grade I had no idea what that even means. You know, right. it's like, um, and I don't know what had happened and didn't happen to me even after that, because he continued right. to be around. Um, but fourth grade, it's like, you don't know. And then as sexuality comes into play, like in middle school and stuff, you know, you start, for me, I like, I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like feeling the pressure. I didn't want to be used. Like, that's my biggest thing is I don't want to be used, you know, and if you don't have feelings for me, if you don't care about me, then I don't want to do any of that. But everyone was doing that. And so that's when I really started feeling the pain and confusion. And like, um, it really started coming out, but I still didn't understand it. So, you know, um, we were talking about this before, you know, I mean, that age is it's, it's awful. You know, when you're a teenage boy or teenage girl, especially now, I mean, you think about social media, the way that uh, everything is over sexualized, you know, I, I like, Mm -hmm. I, have, I have two boys, one twenty and one twenty three, and we had conversations early on. Their mom and 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 I would have conversations with them about, um, you know, making sure that you recognize the humanity and and you know the the um, in, mm -hmm. in, instead of just objectifying women. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not a, you know I'm not sitting on a soapbox or anything like that, but that is the way that women are portrayed a lot. I'm a oh, musician, yeah. right? And it's like just rampantly used in music videos and and mm -hmm. um, and. And I talked to a lot of actresses, right, who are like once they're, you know, out of their 20s, they feel like their career is all over. It's a it's a horrible, unfortunately, it's a horrible part of, of this culture yeah. that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't make sense um, for you to talk about being that age, right, where um, you, you weren't even sure what was going on. This stuff was going on with your siblings. And it really is a drag that I think schools are overwhelmed with this and they don't have, you know, the right kind of crisis management to be able to recognize what might be going on in the home to mm -hmm. just say, Hey, Megan, you know, um, we get the sense that there's some things you might need to talk about. So, yeah. uh, you know, and we don't know each other other than a couple of minutes talking prior, but I kind of get the sense that when you were younger and you talk about hanging with the wrong crowd, you feel like you were blaming yourself for a lot of this too, just feeling like you put yourself in some of those positions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's blaming, like I, I definitely take responsibility, like for getting on the bike for, you know, all of the things like I'm learning the choices I made that led me there, but also I also am learning the confusion I felt and that that's, it's not my fault that I didn't understand. Um, and now I know, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do better and protect myself as best I can. But at that time I was just, I was just lost and scared and sad and yeah. I didn't know what was happening. You know, I didn't, I didn't know how I was reacting was causing more pain. I didn't know sure. how to, I didn't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then, uh, you know, up to this point of the accident, I mean, you're, you're hanging with the crowd, right? So you finally got an opportunity where the people that you're with at least accept you, you feel like you're getting support there. You want to go. No, I didn't really feel like I was getting support. I just felt like I wasn't necessarily judging myself by what they were doing because they weren't going to college. They weren't focusing on their grades and, and so I didn't compare myself, but I didn't like being in that. I didn't like what was around me. I didn't like the parties and watching people take advantage of others and knowing that someone was struggling with a, an addiction, even, you know, at a young age, but it's obvious and it's not funny. And like, they want help and everyone just wants them to drink. And all of that stuff was constantly in my face and I did not want it, but I didn't know how to have something else. Like that was, all I knew. I know that 
you do a lot of sort of community support stuff, or at least you're involved in some events that that discuss this. Do you talk to teenagers quite often in your with your story? Um, I want to do it more often, but um, as often as I can. And there are a lot of people, especially during the pandemic, who have reached out to me um, more and more. So yeah, it's it's a passion of mine. I want to be there. I want to be honest and help them know that they're not crazy. You know, that it's like I had no idea what normal was. And I just wanted I just wanted honesty from people. I just wanted to know, do you struggle? Do you cry all the time? Like, do you want to die? Like, is that is this a thing? Like, am I what? And and no one shared personal things. So I had no idea. And I want to be honest so that they can at least know that you know just yeah no, I mean, that is the, that's the only way to do it right you know if, if if somebody comes up and maybe they're in a high school assembly and they say hey kids here's a story about depression and this is what you can do but without the real um you know tangible conversations that can happen mm -hmm. from somebody who's experienced it uh you know i watched this interchange from friends of mine yesterday um the lead singer from metallica had this breakdown on stage. They had this massive concert and he was struggling. And there's this, there are some pictures of his bandmates consoling him, just holding him on stage. You know, Metallica is this big metal band, right? They're both supposed to be tough and masculine. And I looked at the exchange, a friend of mine who's in a Metallica tribute worships this guy. And he said, you know, thankfully he put himself out there where he asked for help. And a lot of the people were commenting, saying, oh, yeah, he must be uh, like, you know, what a pussy. The guy's got millions of dollars and he's up there crying. Obviously, mm -hmm. these people have no clue about depression or mental illness mm -hmm. at all. Like, you know, and, and they're, oh, I mean, mm -hmm. I, it doesn't matter how many, how much money you have in the bank or how many gold medals mm -hmm. you've won or how many Academy Awards you've won. Mm -hmm. mental health is a real thing. It's not like somebody asking for attention. This is, uh, it's humiliating and embarrassing when you're experiencing it and it's really hard to acknowledge when it's happening to you and mm -hmm. i've talked about it you know my my show the pandemic came from a massive identity crisis that i was having you know i was used to traveling and playing music all the time and everybody that knows me knows i'm very social and i'm a hugger right so i'm always out you know hugging people and when we're stuck inside for two years um my life as i knew it went away and yeah. Um, and, and it really challenged who I was and who I felt like I was. And mm -hmm. I was grateful for the opportunity to get to talk to a lot of friends this way and then develop mm -hmm. new friendships, you know, and um, my dear friend, Anthony Gaynor, you know, connected you and I, he was telling me about having worked with you at an event, I think in Texas, is that right? No, in LA at the Angel oh, City game. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and he's too. He's some Anthony's somebody that has opened up a lot about struggles that way, and he's mm -hmm. uh, he's not afraid, you know, to admit when we need help. Mm -hmm. When I read that, the interchange between the people talking about the Metallica singer, my first reaction was to say, you know, you have no clue, and and argue with them. And it's just like everything else right now in social media, it's so divisive. The only way to get across to somebody so that they can understand is to listen to them maybe guess or have them explain why they have this particular perspective um now for you you know you talked about having you know like there were some boundaries that you were trying to figure out how to establish you had these people that you were hanging out with when you had this accident mm -hmm. i can't it's in it's unfathomable to me to imagine your mindset at that point when everything was, when the, when the accident was over and you're in the hospital and you're starting the recovery and they came in to talk to you about this, you want to talk about your mindset? You want to talk about like that point in which you really had to make some serious decisions about what your life was going to look like? Yeah. Well, that part was so easy. Like the accident, the being in the hospital, I, you know, I lost 30 pounds in three weeks because I was like puking and, you know, not able to eat. Um, I had three major surgeries. Um, they put a cage in my back around my T12 that shattered and they put rods in my arms. So I have like scar up here. Um, and I don't know that I was in denial. I didn't know in the hospital, you're just like, 
I'm going to be fine. Like, and I'm yeah. not paralyzed. Like this, I'm going to, I'm going to go to rehab and I'm going to, you know, work hard for seven months and I'm going to leave there walking. And that was, that was what I was going to do. So I wasn't really thinking about, I had, I didn't know how you couldn't think about what life's going to be after. You have no idea how to even think that way. Sure. So then I went to the nursing home for a month because I didn't want to go home. Um, I, you know, because there was a lot going on at home, still just a lot of struggles and turmoil. And then also because of my depression, I didn't want to be around anyone that I was going to have to feel obligated to be nice, like to, to say thank you all the time. And, you know, I didn't want to, like, I needed help with things, but I was so sad. And I just didn't want to even talk like, as it was setting in. And so I went to a nursing home for a month so that my bones could heal before I went to rehab um, for physical therapy. And, and when I was there is when it really got dark and started hitting me that this is like real, like I can't get up and walk across the room to get the hairbrush. Like that was one of my first realizations of, wow, you know, like I'm, I'm paralyzed. Like, I don't, I don't know. It got hard, but I still told myself that I was going to go to rehab and, and I was holding on to that. So then when I went to rehab, um, and they sent me home in two and a half weeks, like insurance, it's just a joke. Like I had quad, my quad muscles were coming back. Like they were getting stronger. My feet were stuck down and I'm not quite sure why I know that they weren't wrapped. I I mean, probably in the nursing home, they hung, um, and the Achilles tendon tightened up. And so in rehab, I was on my tippy toes and my quads were coming back. So something needs to be, you know, you need to address and fix an issue, but it just seemed like they were just trying to get me through and get me out. And I remember at my discharge meeting, I was like begging them. I'm like, I'm not ready. Like, don't, I don't want to go home yet. Why, why are you sending me home? Don't you see the potential? Like, and so going home was devastating. Um, I laid on the couch for three weeks straight, just staring at the TV, not eating or drinking, um, not watching the TV, just numb and wishing that this every, you know, I would I honestly just wishing I would die. Like that's my, my thought most of my life, it was always in my mind. I just wanted it to be over like, and that's so dark, but I was in pain all the time. Um, And so, yeah, I laid there for three weeks, just tears streaming down my face. And, um, and then my mom convinced me to go to the grocery store. And that was like, my first step was just going to a grocery store and trying not to cry and, um, having, you know, I'm in a small town and everyone knows me as the girl that had all this potential. I was like most athletic in high school and middle school. And, um, the one who just ruined it all, you know, who just wasted it, like, some, there were some parents who saw me as a bad influence, I'm sure, which I, I was always a good person, but, you know, I was not making great choices, didn't have that great home life and stuff. So I felt like I was very, either people were looking at me with so much pity, um, just everyone knew about the accident and, um, or they, or I felt like I was being judged, you know, even from like high school friends or people who you know, because there was, I did have a beer before getting on that bike. Um, I shared, I think two beers with my friends. So I had a beer and so alcohol is involved and you know how rumors spread and everyone's like, Oh, but were you drinking? And it's like, it sucks that that's like your main question, you know, but yeah, there was drinking. Um, and so yeah, going to the store, uh, they would come up to me and I'm just, I'm just trying to hold my head up. And that was like the biggest lesson is learning to hold your head up, like throughout all these looks, throughout all these people that you feel are looking at you with your life is over, you know, like, and um, you're trying to tell yourself your life's not over, but that's not what society is telling you nonstop. Um, So they would come up to me and they would say, I'm so sorry this happened to you. You're too young to be in a wheelchair or just crazy things, even like you're too pretty to be in a wheelchair, just the like everywhere. People say the weirdest things that don't really help you to see positively or even understand what they're saying. Or they would say, um, they would say that I'm such an inspiration and I would feel so fake. And I was just like, what are you talking about? I'm at the grocery store sitting in a wheelchair because I'm stuck like this. I don't want to be here. 
that doesn't make me an inspiration. Like, what are you talking about? I want to die. Like, yeah. and, um, and I just, I, it got so old after a while. I trying to like fight all of those looks of pity and trying to tell myself that when they tell me I'm an inspiration, that it means something, but it didn't. And so I said, I just told myself that I'm going to do whatever it takes and I'm going to make sure that they never have a chance to look at me with pity again. And that um, I'm going to be an inspiration. Like I'm not going to hold back anymore. Like if I ever get the chance to make it right, I'm gonna, like, I didn't know how, because I didn't know there was anything I could do, but I had potential in every sport. Soccer was my b biggest one. And I held back all the time because I was scared. And that regret was so horrible. Like thinking I would never have the chance to face that and make it right. Mm. So I just, yeah, that's when I made the decision. And, um, and I still took another seven months before I found out about wheelchair basketball. But I knew that if I just stayed strong and held my head up and I started going to the gym every day, uh, just working out alone, watching everyone doing everything I wished I could do, watching them play basketball on Tuesday and Thursday and wishing I could join and play volleyball and really wanted to play. And it was hard, but I just knew it was going to be okay. And then this kid came into the Y seven months later and he asked, he had just been in an accident and he asked him if they knew anyone else in a wheelchair he could talk to. And they gave me his number. I called him and he had heard about some guys that get together and play wheelchair basketball, like 20 minutes from where I live, which blew my mind. Um, and so we went and checked it out. And as much as I also hated it, uh, because it, the chair didn't, you know, I was in an everyday chair trying to play. That's impossible. And and it takes a lot of skills to be able to get your chair around another chair and get to the hoop, you know? Um, so it was just like running metal into metal over and over again. And every time it was a reminder that I'm stuck in this wheelchair, that I can't just get up and get around this person and that I hate my life. Like that is every time I ran into the metal, but I knew I had to face it. Like I had to keep going. And um, I wasn't going to feel that regret ever again. And so I did. I kept going. And um, I learned that there were colleges that offer scholarships and for wheelchair basketball. And I had I, that blew my mind. And I learned about the Paralympics, which um, I had watched the Olympics from the nursing home bed with my dad, tears streaming down my face, feeling numb, watching everything I could no longer do. And if the Paralympics had been on TV two weeks later, I would have seen everything that I could do. But I didn't. So when I learned about colleges with scholarships and the Paralympics, I said, no matter what it takes, I'm going to be the first in my family to go to college and I'm going to earn a scholarship and I'm going to make it to the Paralympics. And I did whatever it took. And it was not easy, wow. but I did it. <laughs> Man, you know, it's amazing that I think about this guy that showed up at the Y, right? You said that he had just had an accident and he was asking. Mm -hmm. and, um, so you went, you both went to go check out the wheelchair basketball Mm -hmm. Did he feel as driven and also intimidated as you did, do you think? Or did you stay in touch with him at all? Um, I haven't talked to him for a long time. His name was Nick Starr. Um, we played, we went to Hoop Fest and played there together like a year later or something. But um, no, he wasn't really as focused as I was in that. Um, but he enjoyed it. And he was a conduit, though. He was a catalyst in order to just get you there. I mm -hmm. think. Um, it would, you know, there's sort of two directions you could go at that point. You know, you mentioned that there were the challenges you saw all the, you know, the, the objects in your way, and yet you, you were determined and people could either go direct, you know, go either direction, uh, as a musician, you know, one of my biggest fears is the loss of my hands, you know, and, uh, uh, mm -hmm. your friend of mine, my best friend is a drummer and an ALS has, has taken his ability to play. And, um, and I watched this struggle with him. We talk often about what's, what his mindset is like. And, um, you know, early on, I remember the conversations often being, um, just frustration and you, he, he's felt desperate, you know, like why me, you know, why, why is this happening to me? And, and now he's, you know, he's done whatever he can to sort of surround his life with things that, you know, make his life better. You know, he's still a, a drummer at heart. So everything that's in his man cave is drum centric and he's got a great home theater system that he watches lots of great stuff on. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing that I've noticed with him 
it's it, there's a parallel there you talked about the the looks that you get and the pity uh, mm -hmm. you know people talking about you being an inspiration but also uh, making comments i know with him oftentimes people are afraid to reach out they haven't been reaching out as much because they don't know what to say and mm -hmm. you know, he is that same guy that just happens to be you know in a in a physical position where he can't do what he could do before but his mind is still there his brain and his heart are all there when people don't reach out because they don't know what to say and i, I thought you know it's okay to say that say you know mm -hmm. i've really struggled with the words you know to know because i i don't want to say something that sounds like i'm trying to cheer you up or you know make you feel worse and so i just want to be with you and and you tell me how you're doing did you get some of that? Did you feel like people were unsure of how to talk to you about the accident and the challenges that you were facing after? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they did. I don't know that, um, I mean, there were some friends that like didn't come visit me in the hospital and I didn't think about it a lot, but some like other people would point it out and I'd be like, hmm, I don't, you know, but you know, it turns like they just didn't know how to handle it. and. Um, I don't know. I think that, I think the hardest part was how everyone in the beginning was all there and like made a, you know, it was a really big deal. And like, um, it was sad and it was a tragedy and all of that's like fine to, you know, but then it faded out and like, all of a sudden I'm supposed, this is just supposed to be okay now. Like that was my struggle was it, like, it, I didn't want it to be normal. I didn't want it to just be accepted that I'm in a wheelchair and I didn't want to forget who I was. I didn't want them to forget who I was like, but I didn't know who I was anymore anyway, you know, <laughs> but it was like, well, you know, I mean, in a, I would say when I look at this objectively and not knowing you before this opportunity again is a chance for you to define who you are. Right. I mean, early on you had all these signs from the universe telling you, you weren't sure who you were, you know, I mean, you talked about the break with your relationship with the, with the parents and, you know, your siblings were all going through this horrible traumatic issue with a stepdad. You've got all the other challenges that come with being a teenager in a small town. I know about all those things. And, and then, you know, you're, um, you're handed yet another challenge that you get to face. So now when you look back at this, the Megan Blunt that gets to go and they, it gets to talk to high school kids who inevitably are dealing with families that split. They're dealing with sex abuse and mental abuse and, and all those things that, you know, you had to unfortunately traumatically deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, you, is your perspective at the point where you can kind of get outside yourself a little bit and, and at least recognize it in some people so that you can offer some solace or are you not there yet? Cause I don't mean to put that, that's a lot of pressure on you when you're already trying to like figure, you know, the, the next. No, that was what gave me strength was knowing that by me being strong, I was helping others because I didn't, you know, with depression, when you don't, even want to live anymore. You don't do it for yourself. You're not like, oh, I feel like going out in the sunshine and enjoying this nice day, you know. Yeah. But if you know that going out and spending time with a kid in a wheelchair who could use a good mentor was important, then I that's what motivated me. Um, and I never, I never said why me. Um, I'm not saying it's bad to say that, but I knew why it was me because my I was so lost and it was like the universe had multiple times tried to be like you're not on the right track like get it together and it just kept giving me these warnings and then you know this is what had to happen for me to wake up and and I accept that like and yeah you know perspective is a, is the real key there you know for me too I I recognize that the times that I really, I grew were when I was able to change perspective. And again, I mentioned during the pandemic, that's where I recognized that my lifelong sort of pattern of depression, I didn't even realize that that had been something I dealt with forever. When I, I found journals um, about a year and a half ago, our area had a lot of fires. And so we were all evacuated and I got all the stuff out of the attic and I found journals from when I was 
13, 14, 15, all those years I talked about depression and suicide and, and wanting to end it all and feeling so out of place. But that was gone from my memory. I didn't even remember it. I would read these journals and think, was that really my handwriting? I, yeah, I do remember those points now, but realizing that that had been an issue my whole life really did give me an opportunity to then seek some help and realize mm -hmm. that, wow, had I recognized it then, I may have been able to make changes, but I wasn't ready for it. You know, the yeah. perspective was I, I, it led me to this point now where halfway through my life, I've got an opportunity to now take what I've learned, look at those things in the past and then, and then grow from them. Um, you know, I've heard some mm -hmm. interviews that you've done in the past where you talked about some of those regrets, you know, a lot, not having taken more time to play soccer or taken advantage of it as much. But one thing I don't hear what I love is that you, I don't hear you talk about, or at least um, focusing on being a victim at all. What I hear is a lot of um, those opportunities that you seek, you know? So, so maybe some of the things that you've recognized that now you have the drive to go out there and do this, you got, you know, you see that no mountain is left, you know, like is, is unclimbable um, to go from where you were to being a gold medalist in Rio is is remarkable you know for me i mean it's you know I, I didn't think i could even climb you know the hill on the other side of the town because my depression was you know i couldn't get out of bed right it was that 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 suffocating yeah. thing. so um and i'm sure there were days where you felt like i do not want to go work out i do not want to go to the gym i definitely don't want to face this again back in the chair um, yeah what was the time span between the time you first started playing wheelchair basketball to the time that you got this medal around your neck? Well, so I started, I, the accident was July 20th of 2008. And then I started playing in like June of 2009. Um, that's when I first like met the guys. And then I think it was two years later, I started school at the University of Illinois on a full ride scholarship in um, September of 2011. And I cried every single day for five years, like hard, painful crying, um, pushing to class crying, you know, pushing across the campus, waking up at 530 every day for practice after getting no sleep. And, um, and it was really hard. My family wanted me to quit and come back home because they were worried that I was going to take my own life. Like it was, it was so hard. And my motivation for making it to the Paralympics was telling myself that if I can make it to the Paralympics, I will overcome my depression. Like I thought that I would learn to believe in myself and um, I wouldn't let things affect me. Like, how could you, if you're going to make it to the Paralympics, you know, like by that point, you're going to be good. And, um, and I, after, you know, I put everything into that and I made it to the Paralympics and we won gold. And then I also graduated with my master's in social work um, right at the same time. So after that, I moved back to Washington state and, and it was devastating. It was like, I had been go, 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 stay distracted, stay focused. Like I never even thought about all the things that I couldn't do anymore because I stayed, I was at the gym. I was like, wheelchair basketball it gives me an identity you know like people see me as more than my disability and um and and then when it was all over my depression was worse than it was before because i thought that um i thought yeah i thought i was gonna overcome it so that was devastating because i didn't think i could live the rest of my life with this mental illness that was crippling and and the thing where you said you could go you know a couple ways after the accident like i never thought i had a choice to not fight because if i did not try i was going to take my life like there's no way i was gonna just let lay on the couch until i die from being like a vegetable you know it i it was constantly coming at me and hurting me and and if i didn't fight non-stop it was so exhausting then I would die. And yeah. I didn't want to take my own life. I did not want to do that. Uh, that. So that was my motivation and my drive. And that's what we were talking about before this started when, you know, no matter how much money you have, no matter how many, like the, the gold medal and doing all of that, I mean, it taught me a lot. It, 
a lot. And it's given me this opportunity to help others and have a platform. And, but um, I also have learned so much about my depression. What is it? You know, like, why is it there? And I was fighting it all wrong. You know, I thought just ramming into this like brick wall over and over again, I was going to break through eventually. And I, that's not, that wasn't the way to go. I, I, it wasn't just depression as we talked about. It's, it's your mindset. It's your perspective. It's the way that you put expectations on what you think means someone cares about you. And if they don't meet them, it hurts you. And, and it's all of those things that I had no idea I was doing. And then it's triggers that I didn't even know I was experiencing. Yeah. And um, learning all of that, I mean, I, I have triggers. I see them coming. I'm aware of them. And I try my best to take care of myself. But sometimes I just lose the strength. And, and it my mind does take me down. But I know what's happening, you know. You know, boy, it's it's beautiful that you recognize those those elements. And there are so many things in there that I can relate to. You know, that conversation we talked about, right? So the mm -hmm. singer Metallica, I think he probably, like you, he was ramming, you know, doing 300 shows a year and you know, constantly getting up on stage and writing new gold records and getting out there and playing for all these Everyone's lives. being like, wow, good job. You know, you're doing great. And it's like, you're and, just going off that. And you walk off stage. And all that goes away. And then mm -hmm. what's next? You know, the and your dopamine drops. Oh, yeah. And you're uh, worse. It, it, the, um, there is, you know, in the, in the music realm, when you finish a tour and life then gets normal, normal, whatever, you know, gets real mm -hmm. again. Um, I see that there's a comment there from Scott Kramer talking about how, you know, music, sports, life in general, this discussion needs to happen. Uh, Scott knows this very well. Scott's been out as a tour manager in bands and he's, we've, he's, uh, he's got a lot of overcoming adversity and he'll be the first to agree, I think, with this, that um, when that part happens, when you get off stage, when you get through the, um, the Paralympics, right, you've got your gold medal what's next right what is megan blunk all about what identity what is she uh what is her true identity your true authentic self as you know it's become a buzzword sort of thing right now but the real sense of it is um you know that you are not what you do right i mean that what you are defines you so um we the comedians are a, a perfect example of this you know really famous comedians unfortunately have taken their their lives and people expect because they're funny and they've made a lot of people laugh that their lives mm -hmm. are wonderful right and i'm funny yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they get off stage and they realize that their life is unmanageable you know and and it's horrible and tragic and i think people recognize that when they see you know in certain areas they they think this tragedy comes out of nowhere and the, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is i think people that are driven that are creative people like you you know that have this tenacity um, probably feel more than a lot of people do you know you're an empath right and so you feel hard when it's great and you feel hard when it's not great and i would mm -hmm. imagine this kind of um these challenges too and and your your uh, um the struggle with that probably affects romantic relationships. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to get yeah. more than that. That was to me. It, it, and, and me yeah. too. I mean, it's cost yeah. me dearly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not it's something difficult. you want to open up with. Are you, are you currently in a relationship right now? No, I just, I was like talking to a guy recently. Um, I don't really date much at all. I try and avoid that. Like, I'm scared, you know, I, uh, and I, I had a couple of spirals, like just talking to this guy, just, I can't text texting in a, if you're dating, it's, I can't do it. It's, it's a trigger for me nonstop because I will read into it and I will, I don't know. It's very hard. So yeah, I just had another spiral and honestly, it's so exhausting and I, and I lashed out and that's, it's no one else's problem, you know, it's, but the pain that I feel. And when you feel like, that person has like, you almost feel like they, they could stop the pain if they would just reassure you and tell you that you're not the worst person in the world. You know, you're, you're just, you're okay. But my, my amygdala that's on hyper, you know, fight or flight, it just, it takes over so quickly. Yeah. 
and I don't really have a chance. I, I do my best, but when it takes me down, yeah. So that that was my my recent experience, and and it 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 it's really devastating to me because without that dating those experiences, I've. I have felt like I've done a pretty good job and I'm, you know, really doing well and making progress. And then all of a sudden it's all gone and, and you just hate yourself and you're in pain and, and it's so hard. And because you want to be close to, you want to have that, but you're too scared. And then you push them away and that's oh. lonely. Oh, and I'm smiling. I'm not, I'm not smiling at your situation. I can just so relate. You, you I know, know you do. <laughs> yeah. After what we talked about, yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm dating right now, and I think I overshared with the gal that I'm dating. We've been together eight months, and I'm t completely in love. But in order for her to really understand me, warts and all, I had to come in and just completely throw all cards on the table because I didn't want to get in the situation you're talking about. Texting, mm -hmm. I think, is the downfall of 90% of the relationships I've heard about. You know, I think because there's always the opportunity to misconstrue what somebody else is saying. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the fact that you've got your MSW, right, you understand, um, you know, this interpersonal communication. Uh, I like mm -hmm. that, that uh, you, in your field, something that really changed my life was a gal right here in, in the Seattle area, right, Marsha Linehan, who came up with this dialectical behavior. Thing. I'm on the waiting list for I, a year. I did a six month program last year. Yeah. It changed my life. It absolutely mm -hmm. did. I, yeah. I did a 30 day uh, inpatient program. And then I did a six month um, and dialectical behavior therapy. I thought- You knew how to process those things you read into. Maybe they're taking care of their baby. Maybe they're like helping you to understand that. Yeah. Uh, everything, not just even those kind of, those parts of the communication, but the four modules that kind of went along with DBT, uh, mm -hmm. the mindfulness and the interpersonal communication. I thought I was a great communicator, right? But beyond that, like, emotion regulation and distress mm -hmm. tolerance, those things mm -hmm. I was so crappy at, right? I mean, when, when things were out of control, my mind would go to the dark side and, you know, and really the, um, the emotion regulation, like my emotions just like were so manic. It was, it was insane how, um, I was, I was, most people see me, especially on social media, they see, they think, oh my God, this dude is happy all the time. He's always smiling. If I'm on He's stage, together. If, if I'm on stage, that's the one place where I can focus and center all my attention in that one place. And I really am in my element. And it's a, an amazing thing. And I would imagine sports have been oftentimes that euphoric rush for you. Um, yeah. I'm guessing, but I know that outside of that, I <laughs> wish that I could have uh, the ability to just go there all the time. You know, it's like, I, I wish, you know, the gold medal went around your neck and boom, depression's gone. Everything's fixed. Yeah. It's not how it is. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but the relationship part, you learn how at least how to recognize some of those triggers early on. Boundaries were really tough for me. How about for you? Like me having boundaries or respecting other people's boundaries? Actually, re, um, re demanding boundaries in your space. So, like, yeah, you putting boundaries up when people have taken advantage of you in the past. Yeah, I think, um, I think boundaries, they're, they, I think it's more about, yeah, trusting that I know I need to have this. And if they don't respect it, then that is their choice. And that we don't have to be in each other's lives. But my my thing is I, I always question my gut. And, you know, um, when that happens, like what our stepdad did, it's like, is he a good person? Is he a bad person? Like, how come I don't feel safe, but I'm told he's a good, you know, like. Yeah. Um, so that's where I struggle with it, because I think that what I need is uh, maybe I'm just not healthy and I need to learn how to be OK with what this is you know and 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 then i try and then i get so hurt and i just get it just gets worse you know that's why we end up in so many toxic relationships because you don't you don't know yeah how to understand any of it i'm curious because uh with your degree and you know you got your master's in social work where are you wanting to be a counselor or are you in that field where you're interested in pursuing that um, I wanted to get my PhD in psychology. Um, I 
I had two years left of eligibility to play wheelchair basketball and to make it to the Paralympics, I needed to keep playing at, in college um, because that's where the coaching and the competition is at. Uh, the opportunities for us are limited, you know? Um, and so it was a two year program for the masters in social work. And if I'm being completely honest, I just knew that it was going to be easier. And I didn't know if I was smart enough to do the PhD and, um, but yeah, what was your question about that? I was asking about you if you were curious to oh, yeah. and experiencing or uh, interested in counseling. Yeah, and I I am, but I don't think one on one like listening to someone and continuing. I I would want to just like tell them like these are the things I know. Here's some tips. Like be like more like a coach, you know, and then like yeah. get them going and um, the more like you know speeches and giving them it all at once and. Yeah. You, you do seem really comfortable, you know, talking about your situations and your circumstances. I can certainly see you out, you know, in, in a in a public um, environment, you know, because I think even if there's a group of people that haven't had the physical issues, you know, physical challenges that you have from an accident or even, you know, from birth, but emotional challenges too are debilitating, right? And so yeah. they're um, more debilitating than this tremendously. I mean, I, I bet you would say that the the mental side of of like your challenge has been. Much That's more another difficult. reason why this wasn't hard for me. Like yeah. it was, I was like, this mentally, that's hard. This is nothing. It's amazing, and the people that don't understand might feel, might think that's just you know, it's incredible, but. Uh, it does say a lot about, you know, your ability to sort of compartment or to, to differentiate between those two. You know, a lot of people have a hard time going to work because their job sucks and they hate their boss, right? You know, and, and you're, you took a look at a position that you're in and you just said, all right, I'm, I'm doing this no matter what. You got through the Paralympics in Rio. Um, is there because you talked about being a coach. I mean, I could definitely see you being in that kind of position. Is that something that you, you, you might want to do in, in athletics? Yeah, well, like I do coach. Um, I'm sponsored by the Hartford um, uh, Life Insurance Company. And so they bring me to a lot of events and I get to coach like camps there. And um, I'm going to give a speech to an elementary school this Friday, actually four assemblies, um, grade second to seventh. And so... So I'm going to reach out to a few kids that are in that area and see if they want to meet up and I can coach them, you know, because I wanted to coach so badly after my accident. And it was like when I went to play with those guys, it just it was just like I love the guys, but they were just going up and down the court, shooting threes. No one's playing together like and I wanted to be an athlete again. I wanted to actually learn how to move my chair and like. And that was another thing that weighed on me is I don't have that opportunity. This is all I have. Like this whole state, this is the, this group of guys that get together and there's no coach and, and it just, it just sucked, you know? And, and a, and a basketball wheelchair is like $4,000. Yeah. If I wanted one that fit me, that I could actually be athletic with good legs, you know, like you want to play in high heels or do you want to wear like tennis shoes? Right. And that's the, so all of those things were, were hard, but coaching, yes, I, I do as much as I can. I will give you everything I've learned through all my college years and USA, because I can change everything that you need that no one has told you yet. I can tell you it all in like 10 minutes and you can now move forward in your life, you know? Man. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. It seems like you'd be able to do that in all sorts of realms because you see things from a different perspective than people often do. Yeah, I know that you've got a cool sponsorship with the chair too, right? Are you still with that same chair company? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I am with Performax uh, for the basketball wheelchair and everyday wheelchair too. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. The Performax, mm -hmm. there was a little promo video that I saw with you. And uh, yeah, you, you make it look like a, a cool little spaceship. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, oh, there's something you were saying about uh, being an empath too that I wanted to like something I learned because you know, when you're trying to understand why do I struggle with depression and like, am, I'm just an empath, I'm extra sensitive or different things. I, um, I think it's just trauma. Like didn't Buddha, like he said, like, you know, experiencing trauma in your childhood is like the only way you can become a, like a healer or something. But when you experience that, then you're on, um, hyper alert of like protection, you know, who's going to hurt me, uh, 
facial expressions, tone of voice, body gestures, like you're, you're paying attention to everything all the time. And that makes you very sensitive. Um, and then also helps you to pick up on what people need. And, but it also can really, you know, inhibit you and be hard. But I mean, I think that's what causes that empath to be like, so much more intense. Yeah, mm -hmm. intense is a good word for it. You know, there's some anxiety that goes along with that. You know, I, I equate it to being maybe, you know, um, a dog, you know, that had come from an abusive family, right? And so it comes into a new relationship and new household and it's kind of guarded and it's watching you all the time. And if there's any similarity to what it had in the last place, mm -hmm. you know, it's on high alert and, and extra guarded. Um, you know, I think about you in the dating world, you know, and, and you know, I, I, dating sucks. No, honestly, I will mm -hmm. say, it. man, I, it, uh, I, yeah. I was, you know, I was with the same person for, I was married 28 years and I was in one other relationship for quite a while. So I've really only been in like three relationships my entire life and going into dating at like 50 was not at all appealing to me, you know, and, <laughs> and I meet dating. people all the time. Mm -hmm. But I don't like to play games, you know, and I'm, I try to be just real. And so I saw that a lot of people were out there playing games. Mm -hmm. when, when you talk about, you know, the, um, the uh, being on hyper alert and high, you know, so I'm always then watching for red flags. Okay, so what is it about? And, and I know that they're watching me too. And I really felt like, you know what, I don't like that even, um, I don't like feeling like I'm guarded at all in a relationship. I just want to open it up and like, look, I don't mm -hmm. want to speculate about who I am. Here's here's everything about me. And if it fits, then then awesome. This is really good. Mm -hmm. But at least I'm giving you an opportunity to learn about it now so that, you know, six months down the road, you don't find out that that, uh, you know, I'm a nutball. But mm -hmm. I um, I think that that part of communication is really important because I start to see it in relationships with clients, you know, got a web business and with bands. I'm honest to a fault. You know, it really gets me in trouble sometimes because mm -hmm. I just I remember, you know, bandmates saying, why are you just disclosing all of your shortcomings to everybody all the time? Yeah. It's not that I'm trying to point attention to it, like I'm dwelling on it at all. I recognize mm -hmm. that they're shortcomings so that I can focus on working on getting rid of them, you know? Yeah, it's shine the light on them. And, you know, there there is healing in doing that. I, I, I too did that. I do it. Not as much, but always end up in some hour long deep conversation with someone, you know, and what I also learned is that like oversharing is a, a way that you hope if you tell them all of this stuff that they won't hurt you. Like it's kind of like deep down that's kind of, and it's true. It is, it is my thought process. I'm like, if, if I can like just get to know them enough and they know me, then I can know that this relationship is like solid, you know, like it won't um, scare me or anything, but oversharing is also how you get hurt because if you share too much and you think they're going to care and then they don't, um, that hurts you. But if you don't share that and you maybe just like give, this is what I'm going to work on next dating. I'm going to give a little bit. Like if we have to text, I'll send a text. If they respond, um, then I'll give a little more. But if, if they don't give a little more, then okay, I'm going to leave it right there. You know, like I'm not going to, give more and then get hurt when they don't give more and then give more again and get in it just like that's there's, how i hurt myself there's the I have to again slower. Yeah. yeah well you know i'm sure a lot of people could relate to to that that uh, you know i do think that there's a lot that you could offer someone not just in a romantic relationship but i, I see the coaching part i would bet you're, you could be a tough coach you know, if you're out there with uh you know some high school kids and they're kind of taking that sort of half-assed, I imagine you could throw down the hammer. I I think that I am pretty straight up, but um, I don't, I just like, I'm more about they need to communicate with each other and they need to support each other. And like, that's the type of, I think that playing a sport is a great opportunity for us to heal if we actually are supportive and we're not just like, I want to win. I want to be the best and do whatever. I've never been about that. Um, so playing sports, you said it would be like your escape or like you're, you know, being um, creative. And for me, sports were actually kind of toxic for me my whole life, which is why it they scared me so much. The fear, the pressure, the judgments. Um, and because I was naturally good, I just 
it was almost like I felt like I didn't even earn it. So I'm like, how can I count on myself to to do this? But um, they were triggering me a lot because one mistake I would my brain would just that take over and I would look over and see my coach rolling her eyes. I would, mm -hmm. you know, and I would just go down and then you're still out there on the court and my mind is in such a bad place and it's not getting any better it's actually just getting worse and and I fought that my whole life until um I was supposed to go to Tokyo for the Paralympics uh in 2020 and then it got postponed and I was just I I, I was like thank god because I I was on a high dose of an antidepressant I wasn't doing well and I needed to get myself straight so that's when I finally took the time to step away and learn who I am um, outside of sport. Like, yeah, I lost my whole identity when I quit and I had no idea that was going to happen. I, I had no idea who I was anymore. I really faced the disability and all those times I said mental health is so much harder than a physical disability. I never gave credit to my physical disability of how hard it was. Like now I'm trying to do things outside of, you know, just being an athlete, like being a basketball player. And I'm realizing I can't, if I pull all the weeds, which I love doing yard work, I get piles of weeds and now they're rotting. You know, I can't get them to dump them. And and all these things I try and do, I'm getting pressure sores. I'm sitting on my butt, which I don't have butt muscles because of the paralysis. So it's skin and bone and I can only do so much. And the older I'm getting, I'm losing more. You know, I'm like, I, I thought I was going to get stronger and like, I'm actually losing even more of my ability. And so it's like coming to terms with finding a way to pull the weeds and feel good and let go of the things I can't do, like dump the weeds, you know, or like that's where I'm at. So like, yes, the physical disability is very, very, very hard and I never gave it credit, but mental disability to me is still harder for sure. It's a lot harder to treat. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it sounds to me like, uh, you know, you need to have a really great communicating uh, landscaping hunk to come over and pick up those weeds after you pull them and put them in the air. They're now we're going to need to be more organized and like ready for them to come and do that, you know, and I am like spur of the moment, like just let's do all this stuff, you know, so. Yeah. It's just that's kind of like the booty call, but you call them when they're ready to pick up the weeds. You just say, "Hey, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah." Look at Megan's calling. Oh, she wants the weeds picked. Okay, all right. That's, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I really do look forward to seeing the development of your the newest identity. I think um, your your honesty is tremendously impactful you know I, i'm glad that scott kramer was here watching this um yeah scott is, is somebody that i've uh, i've needed to get on my show here because he's um he's watched and been a part of a lot of touring artists and he's seen it from all sides he understands substance abuse and he understands you know the the uh, identity crises that comes with you know being away from the spotlight um when real life happens you know real life is, is a challenge but um it sounds to me like your perspective has been that you focus on those things that are really important. You know, you, you said that you had to find who you were and take time away from 2020 um, and then the focus on the Olympics that way. Um, I, I talked to folks a lot about legacy. And one thing that it sounds, um, you know, like maybe, you know, you touched on this a little bit, but um, when you're, you know, 95 year old Megan Blunk, and you're looking back at all of the accomplishments, everything, all the adversity, everything that you've, uh, you've gone through, whether you have kids or not, whether you have, uh, you know, have changed fields and careers, I just want to know, what is it that you kind of feel like you'd want to look back at and feel like your legacy, what, what it represented? Um, I, I mean, I think changing the stigma on mental health, like, you know, if, if I shared even more, like we talked about earlier, um, about different diagnoses or anything, um, I, I, I'm still me, you know, I'm still the person that uh, is hurting. And you had some, you know, you cared about 
before you maybe learn the diagnosis or something that all the stigma is around and it's it is really not helping anyone to heal or to even seek help and um and accept it if they do get diagnosed or diagnose themselves because that's my case of i figured it out you know um i missed i didn't figure it out i know we can't go into it because i'm not ready to share but um when i was studying mental health in um for grad school i read about all of the different diagnoses and none of them ever even seemed like that's those are not me you know like that's just the but no, they're patterns and trauma. If, if you've experienced trauma, you have one of those patterns. Any of the, you have multiple patterns that are happening. And if you can accept and recognize and be open to learning, wow, like I do, I react like that. And that's causing this. And, um, you know, then you, that's, that's where the healing that, but we have made it really hard for people to even, even listen and hear about it and be open to possibly they have one of that, something like that going on. Absolutely. Everyone thinks not me, right. you know? Yeah, well, because the the idea of even having a diagnosis seems like a stigma to some people. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I misdiagnosed where I was at, but yeah. I think um, the thing is, it didn't really matter to me as much. I liked having a, finally an understanding of what it was so that I could treat it. You know, mm -hmm. if I had diabetes or cancer, I'd want to know, you know, so that mm -hmm. I knew the, a process in which to, to yeah. be able to manage my life and get it under control. And, mm -hmm. I, uh, um, you know, I know that this, it's kind of a heavy conversation, but it is an important one to have. And I'm grateful, you know, that you shared what you have. I, I'm going to lighten it up for a second because one of the, the things that I love to, to do, especially from somebody who spent a ton of time and, in athletics, and um, you know, has had to have a pretty serious side of your life. People that know Megan Blunt, what would they be surprised by? Do you have a, a guilty pleasure that you would disclose here? Uh, I don't. I don't think that there's anything people would really be surprised by with me because, yeah, no. I also discovered I'm extremely ADD, so. Yeah. I've always been told that I'm the weirdest person that people know. And I'm like, I don't know why you say that. And now I know, like <laughs> I am off the walls at times, you know? So I don't think that there's anything I could share that would be strange. Well, yeah, even, uh, you know, like I, there was a, a run of guests that I had that talked about the music that they had, you know, if I went through their playlist and I looked at their music, there were a whole bunch of people that had the same artist like four times in a row, which surprised me because it was an old band. I'm not going to say who. But, uh, uh, you know, some people like because you're very athletic, you're very fit, you know, but you have, uh, you know, breakdown where Ben and Jerry's comes out on a Saturday night, you know, there's a depression night and you're like, okay, it's ice cream, a pint of ice cream. And that's, that's how I'm dealing with my angst for now. Um, I mean, I love uh, Oreos and pudding, like dip the Oreos and pudding. That's really good. <laughs> Put some gummy worms in there, make it the dirt you make in kindergarten, you know? Right. How about like just garbage TV, anything like that? Um, it's really hard for me to get into a show and stay focused. So not really, no. I wish. Do you have any? Uh, well, you know, I never watched TV at all. I, I stopped watching news years ago because I realized that that was completely out of my control and it was stressing me out. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for that. No, ch no plans on ever going back that way. But uh, during the pandemic, I, I binged on shows that, you know, people did. And I used to record a bunch of stuff. And then when I'm on tour and things were grueling and you're out there on the road for a long time and you're just trying to escape, you know, I'd put something on. And, you know, so I, I, I'd i find like dark murder mystery stuff, oftentimes like British crime shows. I don't know why. It just And we, we've been to England a lot. My band's from Liverpool. And so uh, there's like a, a subtle, you know, there's a connection there some for some reason. But uh yeah, I, it's dark. I mean, you know, my degree was sociology, and I loved studying people as well. But mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to study serial killers. I was so into it and dark, dark oh, yeah. right? You know, so I, the mm -hmm. whole pathology behind you know those deviant criminals was something that I. So I, I yeah, I binge that kind of stuff. Well, like, I do. Yeah, I binge YouTube videos on personality disorders and like sociopathic and all of that. It's very intriguing to me. Cause I want to know, you know, I'm like, are you a sociopath? Are you, 
Yeah, when you find those characters, and you know, if you're dating or you recognize, oh my god, my ex actually. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm like, are you a sociopath, a narcissist, a player, or maybe on the autism spectrum? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I am trying to be open-minded, but yeah, you're scaring but, me. <laughs> they don't have those boxes to check if you do the online dating apps. You know, they should say, you know, check one of the above, and you know, hopefully none of those are checked. But but if those are the options between being a sociopath, you're on the spectrum, you know, you're narcissist, and what was the fourth one? A player, uh, yeah, the player, yeah, because player, yeah. straight up just a player. God, <laughs> like, that's all. That's <laughs> that should be the first question because that is definitely the case that most of you know that my gal friends have talked about online dating, and every one of them would run into the players, and they said they, yeah. they stopped doing it because every guy was the same. Numbers, just swipe, swipe, swipe. Uh, and... Yeah. Man, yeah. well, I I hope you find someone who gets you and that you get, you know, that uh, doesn't want to text, that is able to. Uh, Reassure when I need it. You it know, won't be you, too much. the person's going to be out there for sure, but it's going to take, you know, like like for somebody to really get me and be comfortable with me it takes a really special person. I I'm hopeful yeah. that where I'm at right now is is solid that way, but she's doing yeah. some work, man, and for Good. you. Um, I can't wait for the next time that I get to talk to you because it sounds like you're in the process of doing some development right now too, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm excited to hear about, uh, you know, you working with these kids. I do love the idea of you being involved in, in, in more youth's lives because like I said, I mean, that phase of life means it's a huge turning point for a lot of people, you know, in terms of pursuing their life's passions and all that, but also it's a confusing time that really can set somebody off with lifetime trauma. And mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's certainly that been that way with me and uh, you know, the mother of my kids, uh, you know, really struggled with a lot of that. And I wished so badly that we had a better grasp on it or somebody, mm -hmm. you know, that you could just have in your corner that got it, you know? So if every, you know, 12 to 15 year old had somebody that just understood and they could have as, as that ally, you know, and so yeah. it's that, that, uh, you know, I, I would, I don't mean to put that much pressure on you, but at least for an afternoon, it sounds like you get to be that way with somebody yeah. next week. No, I want, I want that. Like that's, that's all I want is to be able to do that. So nice. yeah, yeah. I'm trying to just stay strong and like, just, you know, it's hard when you struggle. Like I just had that spiral from this, dating and um and then i'm you know i'm leaving tomorrow morning to go do the assemblies and i'm like a couple days ago i was just thinking like who am i you know like i'm not strong i'm this and that and that's not true like i'm gonna get i'm gonna find the strength i'm gonna come out of this and i'm gonna share with these kids like how they can do the same thing you know and it's this is life like and it's you're okay that you're is gonna be okay yeah, I mean, the, the fact that you even acknowledge that, you know, if you let those kids know that just a couple of days ago, you know, there was a challenge as well. I mean, that is reality, right? And for really being honest, that is what, uh, you know, there's a daily sort of reminder that you got to go through and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, a ritual where you're not just convincing yourself, but you're, you're manifesting that stuff. And, and so I, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're out there doing it. And, I would imagine, uh, folks, if you came here late and you got to the end of this conversation and you're wondering who this incredibly wonderful person is, um, they can go find out more about you at meganblunk.net, right? So they can see your yeah. story and, uh, and find out uh, maybe how to, uh, to book you for those keynotes to try and inspire their, their, uh, you know, their, their team of inefficient <laughs> Amazon workers, they can come and see, you know, yeah, you want to see how to go out there and kick some ass and take names? Listen to me. Yeah. Well, my Instagram is where I like really shared like all of my struggles and my journey for the last 14 years. But it got this crazy virus where I get thousands of fake followers every day and I can't sort through them. So I made a new Instagram, but if anyone listening wants to like actually be able to see my journals and everything, um, just private message me so that I can find you in the thousands of fake followers and accept it. Cause I had to make the other account private, which is very sad for me. What is the Insta that you wanted to hear? Um, Megan Blunk is the one that has everything. And then my new one is Megan Blunk round three. So it's uh, before the accident, 
after the accident and after the after the accident, which is now. Oh, nice. Is it spelled out three or just the number three? The number three. All mm -hmm. right. So, guys, if you're watching this, then you'll see that the caption is there. You can go ahead, go ahead on Instagram at Megan Blunk round three. MeganBlunk.net has all the goods. And uh, again, if you came here late and you came from a channel other than YouTube, do me a favor. Just go to accesskevin.com. This is streamed there right now. You can find lots and lots of other conversations and a bunch of great ones coming up. So um, heads up to, to those folks that might be curious. Um, in the next, uh, next week and a half, I've got um, John Knapp, an amazing producer. He's worked with, um, he did uh, a lot of David Lynch movies, the Twin Peaks series, and uh, he's done, um, he's a, a worked with Journey and Heart and all these other artists. And then I've got Jordan Kanata from Adrenaline Mob. Uh, and then uh, Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight, Apache. Uh, I've got Master G from Sugar Hill. Living Colors, Doug Wimbish is going to be on the week after that. So lots of great guests coming up. Lots of good ones from the past week. And uh, none more amazing than Megan Blunk. I really appreciate you being here, girl. This is awesome. And thanks, thanks for having me. Anthony Gaynor for putting this together. I really do appreciate that. So yeah. Yeah, we're going to stay in touch. I can't wait to find out about this development. And uh, the next time you're in Portland, come find me, okay? I will. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful weekend.